Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We are live from uh, different time zones today. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, welcome, familians. I'm your host, Abdul Rahman Faruqi, practice pharmacist in the UK. And uh, today is the inaugural session of this brand new series on the evolving role of pharmacists in practice. As we know, pharmacists work in different areas of practice and they have their input in clinical setting, non clinical settings, and all the different settings they work in. So our thoughts were to be able to uh, bring all those practices together in a show and bring those pharmacists uh, with you uh, so they can share their experiences uh, with future pharmacists and also our pharmacists who are practicing in the field and want to change the profession and want to see what other pharmacists are or their colleagues are doing in the field. So the topic is, as you all know, it's uh, the clinical role of pharmacists in community pharmacy. It's about the pharmacist's involvement, especially in clinical decision-making, whilst you work in community pharmacy. And how can you involve clinically? Because if we look at the years of practice, uh, pharmacy, pharmacists historically been involved and have, have been associating themselves with uh, the supply and distribution service. And it's being considered as a, a source where uh, you, 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 you would get your medications from. But obviously, uh, thinking about uh, in recent years, then we moved on, and, <clears throat> and then obviously we've seen pharmacists are, you know, uh, had, have great involvement in clinical decision making where they're involved with, with prescribers and clinicians, and obviously provided their input, which is medication related, as uh, they are believed to be uh, the drug experts in in this field of pharmacy. So uh, to discuss this, uh, we are joined by uh, we are joined today by uh, two very experienced community pharmacists and a practicing pharmacist in developed countries. One of them is from Australia. The other one is from Bradford, England. And we are very also thankful to our education partner, Long Term United University for Women for uh, providing uh, this uh, platform and opportunity, obviously for their students to be able to join us and ask us any questions live. And in this episode, inaugural episode, and we're also very thankful and welcome U.S. University Law students for joining us for the very first time. So without any further delay, I'm going to invite our first guest, Mr. Anwar Ahmed. Just a little bit of brief uh, background about Anwar. He is working as a consultant pharmacist in Paul Beacon Pharmacy in Victoria, Australia. He's an experienced pharmacist. In the year. He's got experience of nearly a decade and, and he's been providing services. And like ourselves, you know, uh, he's, he, he's done his primary pharmacy qualification from Pakistan and obviously they're on rested himself as a pharmacist in Australia and Marshall has developed himself and uh, uh, to be able to uh, deliver those farm services, train a lot of uh, pharmacists uh, on training. And uh, he, I'll just before him for the delay, I'll take him live. <clears throat> Assalamu alaikum, wa. Welcome to our. Wa alaikum assalam, wa alaikum assalam. Uh, good, uh, good day all, and uh, uh, thanks for having me, Abdul Rahman. Um, so. Today's topic will be about the clinical pharmacy services in community pharmacy. Um, I was um, talking to Abdul Rahman before and saying that the one hour is not much time to cover the all all the aspects of it, but we try our level best. See how we go. Um, so, uh, well, well, if if I start from the beginning, I would say that um, um, there was a time in the community pharmacy when the uh, the only only job that a community pharmacist do is to slapping a label on the box or make some potions or whip some cream up. Um, but it has recently changed a lot. I would say in the in the last one decade, there were there were more more in more 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 changes in in, in order to understand uh, can, what a community pharmacy can offer in 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 the clinical services. And it's all around one terminology, and that is drug related problems. So, which normally is every version of DR, DRP that's it comes up. Um, normally, the um, in Australia, if I say Australia, um, people have have seen that uh, um, most of the hospitalization and and the and the um, uh, and critical critical issues is because of the drug related problems. And where you normally get the, the, the uh, most of the drugs, community pharmacy, right. of course. Yes. So they, so, yeah. they, they, so they they thought maybe it's better to um, provide some some sort of a support uh, on the community pharmacy base levels and let's say if that works and it really works basically um, 
So in, in order to understand what clinical pharmacy service is in community pharmacy, it's just a big, uh, it's one of the, one of the big, like couple of sentences, I would say. I would just ex try to explain that in, in few sentences and, and that would be all. I mean, that will cover the whole thing and then we go step by step and, and um, try to explain each of them. Right, let me take if you like one second. Our second guest today, because obviously we joined together and we'll uh, be having a very nice discussion if you're all together and uh, put, provide our input. So the second guest today is Iftek Arelli. Uh, he's a very experienced pharmacist and has been working and associating himself in pharmacy career for over a decade. And uh, he's based in Bradford, England, and they provide a lot of services and trained. And he's a trainee IP as well, which is independent prescriber. He's done his uh, hours uh, with the GP training. And uh, it will, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let him explain himself about his experience. So before any further delay, I'm gonna take Iftek Arelli live. So. <clears throat> Three, two, one. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Iftikhar. How are you? Today? Assalamu alaikum, Abdul Rahman, and Anwar Sahab. Um, and Assalamu alaikum, everyone who's watching us um, in any country. Um, yes, um, uh, Anwar said that um, the pharmacy role has evolved uh, since a few years. First, we were just dispensing and sticking label on the boxes. Uh, now, we've been given more authority to do stuff. So, pharmacists doing clinical stuff. Uh, they're reviewing the medicines. They're um, um, doing travel vaccination that some pharmacies in the UK um, are doing COVID vaccination as well. So um, pharmacies are involved in many, many things nowadays as compared to if you look back 20 years ago. Uh, we are doing long term, uh, are, um, managing long term stuff like hypertension. A lot of pharmacies without even prescribing um, qualification are going into GP surgeries. They're doing medicine reconciliation, medicine optimization and cost effectiveness, etc. So um, it's good to know that, um, and it's good to see that, you know, we are going in, going in the right direction. So um, as Anwar said that, it's, you know, pharmacy is a huge field. And Abdul Rahman, you said that a one hour is very less time. No, for everything. We, we cannot justify. What we'll yeah. do is we'll superficially so, um, cover the things. Oh, we'll just go through basic things, things like the main yeah. things. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, first of all, I'll, I thank Abdul Rahman Sahib and Anwar Sahib, especially Abdul Rahman Sahib, you know, you're doing a great job, you know, giving your, you know, Probably everyone knows that time is so precious nowadays that you know doing long shifts and then coming to home and you know giving time for these things. Um, when I'll just add that when we were studying uh, pharmacy ages ago in Pakistan, there was no framework, there was no network like this. We could see things from other countries, mm. what other people doing. It was just like books. There was no research work. There was nothing. So I think you know nowadays I I think students are very lucky to see to look around and see things. From other countries as well and just compare their experiences so uh probably uh, Rahman mentioned before that one of my youngest brother is um from canadian pharmacist so sometimes he comes over um and we share the experience and we think like wow you know how much difference is it just between two countries you know the way we work in community pharmacy only um mm -hmm. so um it's good to share these experiences and thank mm -hmm. you very much Abdul Rahman, to give us giving no us you're welcome things. and thank you very much yourself as well volunteered yourself sunday morning 10 o'clock in the uk getting yourself obviously up the bed in the morning and volunteering for this session is dedication and thank also you. giving back to pakistan so thank you Tikar. and then over in australia what time is it seven o'clock seven twenty three is that right yeah it's basically half past seven here half past seven pharmacy is closed and uh, you know, uh, obviously, Sunday commitment. You know, family comes first on Sunday. So, so, yeah, to Mr. be Abba honest, to be, a long shift and then come home and giving you time. So you know, just that's thing. very to very. Be, to, be, to be honest, to be honest, I just got a call from the security saying, "Why? What? Are you, what are you doing on a Sunday evening?" <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, it's um, right. it's happened. So yeah, that's, that's what brilliant, was, yeah. excellent, excellent to hear from all of you. Obviously, and then and thank you very much, guys, for joining us. Please share this live session so. Most of our fellow pharmacists can benefit from this, from this session if they have any question. Obviously, you know, the session will be available recorded afterwards. But obviously, uh, when you join us live, you can ask us any question in the Q&A session. So uh, let's just begin with, uh, you know, the, the question setup that we have. So uh, to start with, I'm just going to start with, obviously, how pharmacists are involved in uh, doing interventions clinically in community pharmacy. So uh, to begin with, Anwar, how would you like to answer this question, please? Well... <laughs> Basically, the clinical intervention is more about finding a sort of um, optimum therapeutic outcome. Let's say, I mean, 
some people have this thing in their mind that maybe it's because only the interactions. No, it's not interactions. It could be a dosage form. It could be a, a it could be a higher dose that we're giving to a patient which really don't need it. Um, let's say I'll make it simple for you. Let's. Um, I have an experience. I like. I normally speak to my my most of my patients are elderly patients. They are like eighty plus, and I talk to them and you know discuss few things when they come to and uh, grab the medication and. Some of them, for example, one of one of the issues that happened just before last week is a patient who have a urine incontinence. So the patient is already have a uh, have a dementia and a bit of cognitive impairment. Plus, he's having a ditropan or oxybutynin five milligram three times a day, which is basically have a very very strong effect on the cognitive impairment. Um, so I just spoke to the, uh, the prescriber and I said, look. If you have to give something for your incontinence, how about the, the guy doesn't have any serious issues, right? So how about we just give him beta three agonist, like a like like mm -hmm. a mebragon, and he understand that he said, oh, there could be a cost price here because it, the uh, mebragon is not covered by the PBS, so um, it costs him a bit more. So we try to give him a good price and make sure that he. So the one point I'm trying to make is clinical intervention is not just about interactions; it's about yeah changing the therapeutic outcome, like changing the medication altogether. Sometimes you just say, okay, this medication is not for that person. Even <clears> sometimes <throat> the therapeutic goals are different. Let's say, let's say I, I, I have one of the condition that uh, one of the patient who's 80 plus and his sugar control, he doesn't have a glycemic. Now, if somebody 50 or 60 years of age, his glycemic control goal would be different from somebody who's 80 plus. No, I'm mm. saying like, if 80 plus already have a, have a prostate cancer and having a GnRH analog with that, definitely it will impair his sugar levels. So let's suppose somebody's 50, 60, 50, 60 of years of age, I would say uh, uh, less than si seven HbA1c would be the right 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 figure for him. Let me just break up. What I'm trying to say is patient preference and patient customization of care. So how do you customize yeah, your yeah. care? It's not just about the treatment, it's not about drug, it's about the same drug is going to different population and different people. It's more about. It's more about. I was. It's 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 more about patient centered care. Yeah, patient centered care. For example, comorbidities, age, uh, polypharmacy. Exactly. Like for example, you won't give him somebody a dabigatran if have a solving issues. Yeah. You won't. Exactly. You don't have to go for the eloquence, apexiban. Yeah. But that's that's small things that do make a difference. Like, yeah. um, it depends on the patient characteristics. What's his socioeconomic? Uh, for example, some patient can't afford to have a buy a, a buy a medicine of hundred dollars. Yeah. So definitely, definitely, we go for something which is much cheaper. And especially then, in countries like, out. especially in countries like third world countries like Pakistan or other countries where people exactly. have yeah. Like yeah. very, yeah. very str yeah, struggling to afford medications. If I'm canning, why say, look, you know, and look, I'll, I'll take a bit. I'll, I'll take this a little bit further. Let's say, let's say you don't have to. The example that I gave it to you is very, very technical, right? I mean, a pharmacist who just recently passed won't be able to catch it. That's fine. That's understandable. But clinical interventions involve very small things. For example, somebody who's who's a farmer, farmer and 80 plus, and, and he doesn't know have no knowledge about medications, and he's taking two or three different brands of the same medicine. I know one patient who's ended up in a hospital because he's taking metoprolol 200 milligram twice a day. Well, for just because of that, just because of that, that he's been taking two different brands. One brand he got from the hospital, one brand yeah. from the community farm. Both for hypertension. Both for hypertension. Right. So, okay, let's and, yeah. and that's what, how you catch it. Like, for example, the pharmacy, oh, why are you having two different brands of same thing? And that will do make a difference. You don't have to be finding something really, really technical to just to make a difference. Sometimes small things like this mm. can, can benefit to a patient. And that's what okay. your goal is. Brilliant. Patient well-being. Excellent. If the... How do you manage interventions in community pharmacy in Bradford? So um, I just saw a question that um, from Anam Sheikh that do you have enough time in pharmacy in Australia to intervene? So it's a really good question. Like we don't have time in the UK to intervene as well, to be honest with you. Like you know, the, the pressure is too much nowadays, especially in summer when a lot yeah. of pharmacists take holidays and there's no core available. So it's, it's very challenging. Um, going right. back to Mr. Anwar's uh, explanation is- just to, just, to, just to remind you, sorry, just to remind you. Questions we will take at the end, so we'll leave oh, okay, those questions fine. coming through. So at the end, we'll discuss one by one. Brilliant, okay. And just because so, otherwise, um, we will be diverted. 
Oh yeah. Um, so the prescribing and uh, is Anwar said that the, and you mentioned that these prescribing is so important. Yes. That there's so many examples. I'll just give one from my last week, my own experience that um, we got a regular patient who went into hospital with uh, NSTEMI MI, which is myocardial infarction, and yeah. they go on dual antiplatelet for one year. Yeah. But that dual antiplatelet never, no one takes it off. The patient will stand the two antiplatelet for years and years. Uh, yeah. They're yeah. taking more pharmacies into GPs just to do these works. But Abdul Rahman, you know yourself, like the patient will be Absolutely. taking aspirin in um, another antiplatelet for 12 years, <laughs> which has been issued in hospital just for one year. So I saw this yeah. patient and I just asked him, I said, how long you have been taking these two antiplatelets for? And he said, it's more than one and a half years. And I said, oh, no, that's not right. Like you should be only on one. So I contacted the GP and um, he was really happy. And he said, thanks for letting me know. And he stopped one. So. Yeah. It's prescribing important, deep prescribing is more important. Sometimes we got to like, you know, uh, interactions are very common nowadays. Most yeah. of the pharmacists pick them up straight away. But so now you mentioned, this, now you mentioned if they, that yeah. this is the clinical knowledge coming into practice in community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Knowing ACS guideline, knowing yeah. dual antiplatelet is duration for what condition? How did you tell? How, you've, yeah. you've already gone through two dual antiplatelet, you've gone through statins, you've gone through beta blockers. You know, yeah. and you're going to get the bitters, bitters. Yeah. exactly. Then you've worked out two medications. This is the guideline. This is what they say. Let, let's see how long you've been taking this dual. I looked so this is that. about putting your clinical knowledge yeah. out there yeah. and then involving yeah. yourself. Yeah, exactly. I looked into patients' PMR and it was like taking up ages. So said, look, we need to contact the GP. I can't issue this prescription today. Come back tomorrow, please. And mm. but the GP stopped. To regular, then we gave just the aspirin, and so there's bleeding risk as well. Um, you know, yourself. Exactly. Um, exactly. another thing, um, we mentioned that, um, sometimes, um, you know, like some pharmacies got access now to clinical stuff, so um, blood tests, etc. And uh, we call a normal range, but like we still together and we don't, call, we can't call a normal range, we call a reference range. Mm. So, for example, a COPD patient with. 88 or 89 or 90 percent oxygen saturation will be living a normal life than a mm. person who is not being diagnosed with COPD. And if mm. his oxygen saturation is going down 94 percent, um, he will be going through hyperventilation. So things like that, knowing and you know the patient knowledge, etc., um, yeah. help a lot in clinical decisions. What's normal for which type of patient? The target audience yeah, and the different references for everybody. Yeah. Excellent. So, okay, so I think we have covered superficially about the uh, uh, interventions bit. Obviously, we can't go through everything in interventions in this very short session. So let's talk about health uh, promotions. How do pharmacies in Australia get involved in health promotion and how do they promote health? And what? Health promotions? Yeah. Now, now, again, the health promotion itself is a big topic. Um, it's basically what what we are doing and base, it, it's, it's all funded by the government and actually um the service australia is actually um encourage us to do certain sort of the steps to make changes um in the in the in the um in the overall health of the community um so it's more about changing the lifestyle okay lifestyle modification uh, lifestyle modification for example up somebody, I'll, I'll give you my example. For example, somebody comes in a pharmacy. I also, I'll see him. He's, he's getting his blood pressure tablets, right? And I can see his 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 BMI would be would be more than thirty. Let's say. So okay. I, what I'll do at the same time, I'm gonna ask him a question, or my one of my girls dispense tech is gonna ask a question. Are you diabetic? Are you pre-diabetic? Definitely, we say no, no, I'm not. Then what I'm gonna do is that I'll give him this. Do, do you have that? Um, um, I'll see if I, I can try and share. I can try and share. Yeah, one second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you, can, you carry on. If I yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. try and share. So, carry on. Yeah. I'll just give it this piece of paper, right? So the idea is that this piece of paper has some information. So he's gonna ask some questions, right? And in the back of it, there is a, is a sort of a questionnaire. Now this questionnaire, I didn't make it. It's basically from the from the Australian Type Two Diabetes Risk Assessment Tool. That's from from the from the Diabetes Australia. Now, mm -hmm. for every every question has certain points in it. Like for example, are you from a from a certain certain origin or certain background? For example, if I'm filling up that farm, uh, it will ask me uh, either you uh, are you from a subcontinent. I would say yes. It give me two points. 
uh, what's your weight? Like how much you, you weight? For example, I say 100, 100 kilos. So it, that gave me four points. So something that I will add it up. In the end, it will give me a certain figure. For example, if the figure comes uh, like uh, the, the figure comes up uh, as uh, more than eight, that means I'm being at a high risk. So I may be a chance of getting a diabetes in the next three to five years. Now, right. what we do is that I have this form. When I dispense his medication, I'll come down to him, have a chair and say, look, right. you are at the high risk. How about I send this paperwork and refer to our lifestyle modification people? So there are certain group of people who actually contact this patient and talk about the lifestyle changes that will support them. They will give you the material. They get they give them the give them the diet diet plans. They give them the exercises. All those sort of things that could help him to manage his diabetes if there's any 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 diabetes going to happen in the future. So this is basically a health promotion. Same thing goes with the asthma. Let's suppose. If somebody comes with the with the uh, with the uh, to refill the asthma medication, I will give him something like this. In the meantime, so this I have a question here saying how many times you use reliever in last last one week? How much time you got the? Uh, how much time you use the prednisolone? Or simple questions: How many times is that? Is that is that your preventer working for you? So. In all those questions, when I collect that, I will, I will the, make a recommendation. This is the first form that you shared, isn't it? This yeah, is the yeah. first form that you shared, okay? That's the one. That's, that, so they, we, they, they, that's the front one, and there's a backing of it, a back page of it, that also have some questions. Okay. This is the front one, yeah? Yeah. Let's just show. And this is the second one? Yeah, yeah. All right, so all these questions here. Yeah. So all these questions will give me the idea about what what sort of uh, what sort of a stage the patient is and then we go from the let's it's not just about seeing a patient have an obesity any risk factor for example somebody's on olanzapine yeah right or somebody yeah. uh, somebody is uh, is on the hypertensive medications or yeah. already have a stroke in the last right. last year or so i can always put them into this category and ask them but always they're always a patient concern i can't just simply do it myself i have to ask a patient would you, would you like to do uh, to be contacted by those people who can who can help you with the lifestyle change or not that's up to totally up to the patients but we can help them to make a right decision so that they can be look in the end of the day it would be a burden to the healthcare if they if they diagnose in a couple of years so we helping yeah. ourselves not helping right. the farm, you see, because we lose yeah. the business in the end. But, <laughs> but as as a community, that, that that's that's what we what we're trying to achieve. And Brilliant. same goes with same goes with the smoking cessation, weight management. Um, there's these all are basically our healthcare promotion, more for sort of a, a tools that we do in the community pharmacy. That's all. Brilliant. Over to you, Ifti. How do you do? How do you manage the health promotions in the UK, please? Uh, well, yeah, so um, rate management, so we don't call it rate loss anymore, but we call it rate management. Uh, yeah. Just a simple question, if the <laughs> patient's got some uh, other issues like hypertension and diabetes. Um, when we're talking to patient, we just asked about social history as well, smoking, alcohol, etc. cetera. So um, with smoking, if the box is ticked that the patient smokes, we straight away we um, just uh, speak to, uh, we got, probably stop smoking as uh, champions in every single community pharmacy now. So we just straight refer them to stop smoking services. And when you say champion, what does that mean? As a pharmacist, are you, they're are kind you of more trained in the field. Right. So okay. obviously they don't need more than one in each community pharmacy, but they know probably a, they have a bit more, more knowledge than the rest of the staff about stop smoking. So they've been to trainings and seminars and et cetera. So, and, and they've been updated with trainings um, every year. So um, we will just make an appointment. Um, all the, most of the pharmacists are know about as well. Like um, if the patient smoke that many cigarettes a day, which step then is to go on to um, uh, um, nicotine replacement therapy mm -hmm. and, and Champix, etc. Available some more other options as well. Uh, I, I, I quick would... question, quick question, guys. Uh, I, I, I forgot it later on. Is, is Champix is still available in the UK or it's been out of yeah. stock? So uh, Champix and yeah. I heard about the Pfizer is trying everything to put those vaccines yeah. in running. It's, it's, so it's huge, um, huge supply issues at the moment. So since last week, yeah, we yeah. Any same stock. Here. Same here. But uh, uh, used to be uh, on what's up? It used to be a medicine called Zyban. If you remember, used to be licensed. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. 
that's been taken of the market by nice guideline now so we need to side effects in it to this um mm -hmm. even, even, even champix had a suicidal uh, ideation as a side effect so yeah well but it's still uh, <laughs> and then um, guideline sometimes it get really bad man sometimes it get really bad yeah <laughs> i guess yeah. did, did you try that champix me no, no, no. is it sometimes get really bad no, 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 no. <laughs> i'm looking <kidding. laughs> I, I I have seen people like literally literally shivering oh. because of they okay. they have a they have a nightmare last night and that just they just lost it completely. So it, yeah. it sometimes it really. Does. I'm yeah, just so. gonna add example of health promotion myself when I was in Ireland, Brilliant. and we did a session. Uh, we did a session on uh, how young are you at heart. So if it, you know the the the, the heading looks very appealing, like you know, let's mm -hmm. calculate your heart age. So once real age is thirty, heart age is if you're keeping yourself fit and healthy, your heart would be healthy and possibly younger than your age. And heart age, obviously you know, to calculate the other risk factor that damages your heart. So if you calculate those risk factors and score them, that somehow gives you a calculator. So in, uh, I think we've used uh, British Heart Foundation's calculator uh, to calculate heart rates. And then obviously in, within that, there's some parameters, for example, uh, hypertension, uh, weight, smokers, risk factor, alcohol consumption, uh, cholesterol level, and I think a couple of minutes, I don't remember on top of my head, but uh, those things obviously put them all these reading together and, and then it gives you heart rate. So, I mean, I did that once obviously when I did it. So I still remember that. This is how, and, and in the community, people are very, uh, I would say, motivated to come in and wanted to check, you know, and you were they're giving them a little heart shaped card and in an envelope. So we wouldn't tell them the age. It was like, okay, there you go. And people were like, oh, screaming and say, you know, they're healthy and they're actually heart is younger than themselves. And some of those obviously being overweight, being a smokers, alcohol addiction, obviously drinking habits quite bad, and all those things, cholesterol is high, and we would check them in community pharmacy. We'll have this a test kit and we will do that. And then we'll give them the, the rate. And then, you know, afterward we will give them appointment so they can come back if they're concerned and make an appointment with the pharmacist and obviously discuss how can, they can improve these things. But again, if you don't know, how would you work? You don't know where you're going, it's where you're going, you know, especially with this uh, fast food uh, world that we live in, you know, and it's, it's very appealing to go and eat fried stuff and, you know, all these things. And it's, it's the same globally. So um, how about moving on? If the, you wanted to finish before you move on to next question, next question, please. Uh, yeah, that, so that's how we deal with uh, health promotions, um, especially seasonal promotions. So like now the flu season is coming again. So just identifying the patient uh, who will benefit more from flu vaccination than the others and then um, informing them that the flu season is At starting. risk. For yeah. viewers, because we pharmacists know for viewers, do you want to um, categorize uh, at risk patient of flu? So what would you yeah. think? I mean, which, which, which patients would be at risk? And one more benefit more. So, yeah. No, no, sorry. Just um, for, for the viewers. That is all to do with stopping hospitalization. You reduce hospitalization rate because if we don't pick these health issues now, a later stage, it will cost the health services a lot more. So, you can implement that in any country and benefit from it. Yeah. In community, they also send letters to people at risk, for example, over 60s, yeah. uh, pregnant. And all those uh, with long term yeah, chronic conditions. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, um, how about moving on to the next question? So, it was about screening and chronic disease management. So, uh, I'll start with you, FT, and we'll come back to you, Anwar. Yeah, so screening usually comes um, out of conversation. So, like, patient comes and um, asks for some advice, for example, headaches are, and you think, like, um, another example, uh, sometimes with eye conditions like uh, conjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, okay. We know uh, high blood pressure can cause as well. The patient never been diagnosed with high blood pressure, but come with bloodshot eye, subconjunctival hemorrhage, and you think like, you know, let's check the blood pressure. The blood pressure could be high, and that's causing the capillaries to rupture. And sometimes you get uh, the blood patient diagnosed with hypertension and then repair back to the GP. So most of the thing comes out with the conversation. So patient comes for something else, but you think of something else, and then uh, patient comes and complain. They visit toilet a lot at night time. Um, and they're thirsty a lot more than usual, they're hungry a lot more, they're losing weight. And you say, let's do the blood sugar level, and you do the blood sugar, and the patient is diabetic. So mm. things like that leads to other questions, and um, 
screening. Um, in our community pharmacy, sometimes there's a promotional days, so we will just set up a table, put blood pressure monitor on the table, and anyone walks in through the door or through the surgery door, um, take the blood pressure reading, and just if it's high, then give them a card to go and see the GP. So um, sometimes it's just opportun opportunistic diagnosis. Sometimes they come to the pharmacy for something else, and you think of something else, and you do blood sugar level, high uh, blood pressure, etc., and it's high or low. Sometimes they come with um, shortness of breath and um, and you send them for blood tests and they're anemic. So um, it's just different scenarios and different outcomes. Like, for example, uh, I've seen also working as a local community, uh, yeah. people requesting more uh, salbutamol, a bit of agonist inhalers. So it means they're using it more often yeah. than when needed to. That means your, the chronic condition is not actually manageable. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, yeah. So they need to go to step a uh, higher step in. Brilliant. Anwar, over to you, please. So screening and chronic so, disease management. Yeah. Basically, I just second to what he what if, if said. Um, let's suppose I'll show you this. This is my folder. You can't. Sorry, you can't. See. Blood pressure checks. Okay. Blood pressure check, right. So basically, if somebody, let's say, comes here and um, having a trouble with like lead high, lead headed or or a bit of a bit of lethargic or not feeling well and sort of a palpitation we just check their blood pressure now what we do is that for example if somebody's coming on like say friday or saturday we check ask them to come on friday saturday and monday and have their blood pressure every every day here and uh, then we just make a copy of it send it to the patient or send the patient with the with, to the doctor so in, in, in I, I can't share you the whole thing because of the privacy issues and all that but yeah, basically it has a lot of data that that the patient look like i said before most of my patients are elderly they can't know, even know how to use a blood pressure machine so in that way well, when they come in here we check their blood pressure we talk about it sometimes it's just a little high sometimes it's really high so you just have to make a decision on that okay, what, what you need to do uh, Can I how do i say it? Uh, do you check yeah, yeah. for blood pressure checks no no oh yeah. Business related question. <laughs> 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 no, I don't. I don't. Um, uh, nah, nah, nah. Oh. I'm simply. Come on, you were saying something. You stop. You Go on then. Look, to be honest, there's ten different ways of making up money in community pharmacy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'll I'll sit them with the blood pressure check. Don't charge yeah. for that, but I can charge for different other things. <laughs> So that's basically it. Good to know. Yeah. How about, yeah, I, I do how it, about yeah. if somebody comes in for a wound management? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look, uh, for example, wound management. If somebody comes in, like old lady having a having like, having um a like, sort of a sort of a sort of a cut or bleed. So I'll just simply because I'll do a little bit of uh, wound management as well. Like I'll just do a dress up, put a little bit, clean it up. That's it. Um, but uh, uh, I'll charge for the products. Right. So, so you I'll sell just the use product, the bandage. Yeah. I use it. I sell the product, but but uh, in the end, but it's 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 about it's building a relationship with with the patient. Let like if yeah. you remember that the pharmacist who actually go out of his way yeah. and dress me up for dress the the up, so he will come or she will come to me all the time and say, okay, can you exactly. do? It? And look, in the end of the day, if somebody, I'll, I'll I'll do that sort of a favor, and that patient have a, on on a polypharmacy like five or more medication and comes every month, that's 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 a win for me. Like I'm yeah. making money out of it, right? Yeah. I don't need to make a, make a, make a charge five or ten dollars just for the for the for the dressing. I can make hundred hundred dollars later on, years and years. So it's just about building a relationship with the patient. Quick question, both of you guests. Uh, medicines use review, right? I'm not sure if the, is it been um, is st still pharmacists getting paid for medicines use reviews or stopped how is that working? Yeah. They've stopped it. Okay. So <clears throat> how about in Australia? Pharmacists used to do medication reviews, and the government right. paid those services. We have a different terminologies here. There's there's one we call match check. So match check is something that, for example, like like what if they asked me the question before, have you have you always charged blood pressure? No, I don't charge for the blood pressure. But if somebody's sitting there and having check a blood pressure, I ask few questions, go through a medication. I just simply ask them to sign the consent from the match check, go through their medication, and make hundred dollars from it <laughs> in ten minutes time. Or fifteen minutes time. Yeah. So, in in that and, uh, way, basically, uh, how how I'm, often can you carry uh, medicine? Usually, could be like every month, or it just. Like, is there any restriction? Yeah, 
uh, basically, um, we allow to do 20 mass checks a month, okay. right? But w the person that we dealt with, well, it's only allowed to do one mass check in a year. So uh, let's suppose oh. XYZ patient comes in in January. I won't be able to do the sa same patient mass check till the last, the next, next January. So if there was a UK six months, it can do. Uh, once months. a year. It was still once a year. Once once a year. A year. That's that's right. the mass check, right? And then there's one which called home medication review. So home medication review is basically like mass check you can do on your own. You don't have to have a referral from the GP. But for home medication review, you need a referral from the GP. So uh, let's say somebody somebody's having a lot of troubles with his medication or his medication. Uh, the, the the doctor will send the re uh, referral to us. I'll go or I'll send somebody home at uh, the patient's home. Uh, have an interview for half an hour, make a report of it, and submit the report to a GP. And GP will do it accordingly. Maybe he doesn't like it. Maybe he like it. Maybe so. It it all depends on what GP thinks about it. But our our is more about advisory role. About let's say we we don't think so. For example, I'll give you an example of it. Um, I have a patient who's been using. I I spoke to. Uh, I tell this story to Abdul Rahman um, uh, last week that we. Uh, uh, the patient I spoke to was having a fexofenadine, which is normal antihistamine, 85 years of age, using fexofenadine 180 milligram for one and a half year for no reason. For no reason. Right? Just because of itchiness. There was an itchiness and he was using for itch. I said, why do you want to use the fexofenadine? Well, is it really helping now? Well, I said, no, it's not. But it's just because I have to take it up. Doctor asked me, I'm taking it. So I said, how about I ask the doctor to stop uh, having the effects of inadine and use loratidine if needed so. And mm -hmm. what, what about, I'll make one person menthol, one person camphor cream for you in sorbolin. Mm -hmm. How about you use that? Look, at 85 years of age, you just really don't want to give the extra medicine to a patient. You just, you, it, it is, I'm, I'm sure in UK, there's also a, 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 a terminology called deprescribing. Deep, so yeah. that's that's what that's what we, I'm trying to say. No, Again, it comes to involvement. You are actually looking at the patient and see what is he taking, what's the age. Again, you mentioned earlier about so same thing. Obviously, if somebody came up 25 years old and have obviously you wouldn't go through you know so much details uh, if somebody's prescribed yeah. factors. Well, I won't be worried about that much. Yeah, exactly. Risk no. factors are increasing as you grow older, especially as you grow particularly older. Old, exactly, and there's less evidence. Over eight years or a lot of medications anyway. So, you know, you got to rationalize. When he comes back, when that patient comes back, he's literally praising me because I I make a cream for him. And again, not charging me anything. And uh, I still I make him in You're getting, you're getting him, but... $100 from 10 minutes anyway. So <laughs> that's right. That's, 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 the, that's the whole ball game. But when the other, he, he was happy. He said, okay, that cream gives me a very cooling effect, soothing effect. I'm happy yeah. with that. I have a good sleep after a very long time and while, and I'm very happy. Well, that's yeah. good. That's what I mean. So, Topical, yeah. But like, I think I think like it's I also said, about sorry, sorry for interruption. It's also about looking at the facts that, for example, somebody's got allergies systematically, it should develop in the whole body. And giving facts of finding to where something that's systematic rather than local. So if you're looking at one thing, you give facts of finding for something very local, and you know, it's best to apply any topical preparation that will work better. So it's not systematic more than local. So that's why I think you have to have this sort of approach, like you know. That's right. Some, exactly. And they don't know what they're treating. They don't know what they're treating. There's no diagnosis of it. It's a big hypersensitive reaction. They don't have any any diagnosis. So I said, like, let's see how we use this. It really works well. Look, it 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 won't work maybe, but it, in the end of the day, you you have to try. Yeah. Right. You have to come with sort of a sort of an intervention. So yeah, I, yeah that's that's what. Ifty, please, ifty. Uh, so going back to your question about uh, medicine use review, um, obviously that's been yeah. stopped because yeah. it's not funded anymore. So it's gone yeah. to GP practices yeah. from community yeah. pharmacy. But uh, then NMS, do, NMS, how about new medicine service? Yeah, that's what exactly I was going to do. Yeah. So we uh, do a service like which can be introduced in Pakistan um, <clears throat> or any community pharmacy, which uh, is almost said if you provide the best service, you go out of your way, help the patient out, they will come back to you. Like a disappointing service, they will never, you, you lose our business. So something called New Medicine Service, which is funded by the um, NHS. Um, I can't remember the full list, but it's all the high-risk medicine like antiplatelets, anticoagulants, antihypertensive, all with respiratory diseases, um, 
diabetes. So if the patient is prescribed a new medicine, they take and you recognize that with your computer system that the patient hasn't taken this medicine before. Your first question is, have you taken this medicine before? Because you might have been to another pharmacy to speak to you. So if his answer is yes, you ask them to sign this form and you take his mobile number or contact number. Then you ring them after two weeks or a week time and you ask them, how are you getting on with your medication? Are you, are you experiencing any side effects? So the, the, the issue with uh, and the solution is of uh, the problem is that sometimes the patient will start a new medicine, but they're so afraid and scared of the side effects that they will stop it straight away without mentioning it to anyone, to the GP or the community pharmacist. So this follow-up call is very important. Um, so for example, a patient is given uh, anticoagulant for DBTRPE, which is pulmonary embolism. And the, it's, uh, and the patient um, see a bit bleeding when they're brushing their teeth in the morning and they get worried that because it's a blood thinner, so it can cause these side effects. And they stop taking that. They are very high risk of developing clot. So you will explain to them, look, brushing your teeth, minor bleeding is very normal. Just look out for major okay. bleeding and then stop taking it. So I've seen patient um, after a week and they said, oh, we can't take this medicine. It's, the side effects are major and uh, we can't cope with it. Then my next step is to go back to the GP. And because the GP doesn't know, the patient stopped the medicine. And uh, in a high risk of, you know, what they're taking it for. And then you mentioned to the GP, look, your patient been prescribed this medicine, but is not taking it. It's a paid service. So the uh, pharmacy owners, the business owner um, kind of put pressure on the pharmacies and the pharmacy staff to do this service because they get paid end of the month. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't really um, tell you how much, but I think it's between 28 to 35 pound per service. So it's a paid mm -hmm. service and it, it has reduced hospitalization um, and, you know, people, patients going back to hospitals yeah, uh, yeah. By, by a lot. You know what? It really, it really helps if somebody who's who's just recently discharged from the hospital. Yeah. Look, when you get the pre hospital prescription, most of them are like, if somebody have a stroke, there will be an eight or nine medication they've been on. Yeah. So at that time, when a in hospital there is when they discharge from the hospital, definitely the hospital pharmacy sit with down and is discuss with the detail. That's that's their job, and they do. But again, they feel more comfortable and that's my 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 I, i'm not saying other reminders as a, as a hospital farm but it's my 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 experience that they feel more comfortable when their local community pharmacists sit with them and discuss these medications so that's exactly mm -hmm. what i was going to uh, mr anwar so it's called um, medicine discharge service it's been introduced like five months ago probably for yeah what happens at the hospital pharmacy like abdul rahman will issue a notification to community pharmacy so, for example, a pharmacy is coming to our pharmacy regularly, and um, we call a nomination year, so you can see the, the patient prescription goes to a certain pharmacy. And Abdurrahman will send a notification that this patient has been discharged and he's been given this this new medication. So, we, so that's a paid service again, um, so it's been funded by NHS. So, same scenario, we ring them after a week and just explain to them this is your new medication. Expect these side effects with calcium channel blocker, you might get a bit ankle swelling. With mm -hmm. S inhibitor, you might get a dry cough, but carry on if, if it's not bothering you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has reduced um, hospital admissions a lot as well. Um, another thing, um, yeah, so the deep prescribing again, I think we talk about deep prescribing a lot. Mm -hmm. So uh, same scenario as yourself, you came across a patient, Fexafinity. Uh, we had a patient, uh, nearly 74 year of age, a lady on um, HRT tablets. We keep dispensing it to Venus with it. We never question it. Why 74 year old lady mm -hmm. taking something for menopause symptoms? Yeah. So um, I went back to the GP and I said, look, this product is out of stock. We can't get hold of it. And she looked and she said, oh my God, she should have been stopped 25 years ago. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> That's why that, they have found so That lady was given uh, these tablets uh, when she was 45 years age, when she was going through early menopause, just to take it for two to three years and then stop. But she took it for nearly 20 years. <laughs> like, no, like, well, exactly. On. Once I was taking this, uh, just a simple uh, question sometimes, were you taking it like yourself didn't? But sometimes it's placebo effect as well. So patients just take any medicine for anything and they think about it's working for them. So. This reminds yeah, me yeah. of patient experience in hospital. I was asking this patient a lot of medication. I'm like, okay, do you understand why you, you take these medications? I was going through. And he goes to me, well, doctor knows best. He prescribes me. My pharmacist is really good. He gives me those drugs. And I am compliant. I take them. I said, okay, so do you not know what you what you're taking these for? Well, most I don't. So I'm like, you're very compliant. You're taking all those medications actually not knowing what they're for. So I've gone through one by one and, and was really pleased that I've gone through his medication and he wants this for. 
So sometimes it's about patients, you know, they're compliant and they take their medication without actually realizing, you know, I mean, how this is helping them in their, you know, if they have any problems. For example, imitriptyline, that can be given for six different conditions. So yes, it's good exactly. for patient. What are you taking if Are you taking it for neuropathic exactly. pain? Are you taking it for depression? Yeah. Are you taking it for sleep aid? Yeah. What are you taking it for? So that question out to more information, you can ask more questions. So. Mm. So and also rationalizing approaches where looking at, obviously you mentioned about deprescribing and also about linking those medications together and look at synergistic effect and yeah. providing your input as drug experts. For example, yeah, earlier we have we were discussing about this diabetic patient uh, having developed symptoms of neuropathy. So they're giving uh, medication for neuropathic pain for diabetes long term. For example, gabapentin, giving them amitriptyline and all the other oils. Yeah. Exactly, pregabalin. So, and then obviously with, with more medications, patients obviously sometimes feel uh, goes, you know, they, they give antidepressants as well for anxiety and for all of the other symptoms because they take a lot of medications. So sometimes you see those separately prescribed, for example, for neuropathic pain, for depression and all those things. And then it's good for pharmacists obviously to be able to work these things together, see these are these symptoms. And if I can suggest some one for example, is duloxity, then it works both ways where it would, you know, work for the neuropathic pain relief, it works for antidepressants, and happy days, actually, you're only giving one extra drug and it reduces, you know, it, it resolves the symptoms they're associated with. Right, okay, before anybody has anything else adding on this topic, particular one, I'll move on to the last question, because I think time's running out at 11 o'clock already. Anwar, anything to add in this? Which one, the... Um... The last one, chronic disease it's... management and screening, yeah, how are we involved? Yeah. No, I just... Yeah how do i put it, it sounds better it's it's not about just the drugs and the disease yeah. it's about the lifestyle as well <laughs> um yeah. i find um i find um sometimes it's um if you do a little bit of small things you could make a lot of difference like yeah. um there's, there's, there's one we were talking about the other day, like last week, you know, we, 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 the patient, patient, it's, has, has, his sugar is all over the place and he's not doing well. And um, when he had, when he went to the hospital, um, they, they, they took off from the insulin and suddenly when he comes back again, his, his sugar shoot up. So when I, yeah. when I talk to him about it, um, I, I come to know that he's drinking two liter of wine every day. I mean, imagine that if somebody's drinking two liters of wine every day, what what would be the sugar going to be like? It's it's just high, it's skyrocketing. So, what I did is that I just asked him for the the, the prescribe. Um, I just referred him to, to the um, to a rehab and said the GP that maybe it's best that he he could have a bit of rehab. So it's not just about medication. It's not about just the disease you're managing. It's about looking after uh, it's more about patient-centered care you look have you have to have to have to look the background of a patient where he's coming from what sort of a lifestyle he's living and and, and if you address those things that would make a make a big difference in the end um so yeah that's just what it's all about yeah, yeah. excellent uh, welcome back if we lost you for a minute Hello, <laughs> you, <did. laughs> you know i can't even say that it's an electricity issue because we're in the uk yeah, yeah. <laughs> lost like right okay so moving on to the last exactly. question yeah, so we went to the last question. So we were discussing about providing um, addiction services in community pharmacy for uh, drug users and uh, and how do we manage those patients in community and, and also support services in addition to needle exchange programs. So basically we're acknowledging and recognizing that they're user and how actually we're supporting them for, uh, you know, to understand and also to ensure that they're actually developing themselves or going into something really serious like hiv for example so um ft you please yeah so um drug use is a huge problem all over the world uh, yeah. uk pakistan probably australia usa canada my brother works as i mentioned in canada and sometimes i speak to him and like um this it's a huge problem sometimes it's not managed properly i'll say um i think there's a big gap between i've seen patients going to the gp for stuff like you know they've got a respiratory problem because they you know taking drugs etc but i haven't seen anyone being referred by the gp to drug services mm -hmm. uh when the question is asked they said oh it's up to the patient if he, they need help they need to go there and they ask for help but well, we can't do anything because you know due to the accents you know um consent and etc we can't really do anything so 
Um, we do provide services in our community pharmacy, like you mentioned, needle exchange. Not every single community pharmacy do it because it's kind of too much headache. Can you explain just a little bit needle exchange to the viewers so they understand? Because we understand the pharmacists, but you know, yeah. what, what is the service about? Yeah, Who's so needle for? exchange is um, a funded service, uh, which is sometimes locally commissioned. Yeah, and um, um, so the drug user use needles, obviously, to inject themselves with drugs. Uh, and it's a de they're dependent, so um, you've got to help them out at some stage uh, to, to, to reduce the spread of diseases like hepatitis B and HIV, um, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes they share the needles um, yeah. and it, it can produce complication and uh, create complication in hosp hospitalization. So to reduce um, uh, these hospitalizations and long-term side uh, effects, um, uh, community pharmacy provides drug users with clean needles. Uh, I think Anwar was, was just holding a sharps bean, which is a yellow bean, so to dispose <laughs> them safely. So if you don't provide them with needles, what they do, things are quite expensive. They spend most of their money on buying drugs. So they will share the needles and this uh, possibility of spreading diseases. So they come to the pharmacy, they will um, just ask for five needles, five syringes, uh, we do provide them with citric acid or vitamin C because, you know, drug users have very less amount. And it's used as preservative as well or a sterile product. So just to get rid of any bacteria, which is in, especially in the drugs of heroin. And, um, uh, and then we provide them with spoons so um, to boil their drugs and then to inject themselves. So it's like kind of a full clean package. You can't stop them from tracking drugs. So just at least you can help them from stop spreading diseases. Transmission. Uh, yeah. Um, and no questions, asked, no questions asked. Uh, no questions their, asked. Exactly. No, no asked. date to bed, no personal information, anything. No, no question asked. Yeah. You just ask two questions because you do get people taking up steroid use, uh, you know, bodybuilders, etc. So you ask two questions. Will you take using a person? They will take, say, heroin or they will say steroids. You just, you don't take any information. You just, um, you just register the patient. The only thing you monitor that when they take the needles away, how much you're getting back. So the, the other issue is that they keep throwing it around the streets, children are around, so they can pick you up and they can stop each other with a needle stick injury. Um, it is very high. So you just monitor sometime, like if the patient's taking 10 needles, is taking bringing 10 needles back when they used it in the shop's bin. Or if they're bringing any, uh, the shop's bin is like a yellow bin in which you can yeah. dispose needles and take it to the pharmacy and then they destroy it. So that's the only monitoring we do. Um, and um, obviously you work in community pharmacy or Salab Rahman and uh, Mr. Anwar. So you've probably seen them coming from uh, substance misuse like um, methadone and buprenorphine, et cetera. Absolutely. And, yeah, and, and uh, it's all funded service. So, yeah. Supervisor, non-supervisor. Yeah, well, supervisor, yeah. non-supervisor. Supervisor means that they need to drink or take it in front of you. Non-supervised mean that they can take it away and take it their own time. But obviously, they get monitored when they go back to the drug workers or the, um, the people who provide them with prescriptions. Uh, they take urine and blood samples and they see if they're taking the, the medicine right. Um, so sometimes you will see the doors going up and down. Uh, sometimes they're not supervised, but obviously they're not taking it properly. So they, they get supervised mm -hmm. in community pharmacy. So the pharmacists make sure that they, that they take it while they're in the pharmacy. Mm. Okay, so Anwar, over to you, please. So, what, what was it? Addiction and and support. Um, uh, this that, that's basically the. Um, so that's like like what if the said that is normally what we do here. If we make a fret pack, we call it fret pack. It okay. has uh, the small small bottle, right? Yeah, and there will be a couple of syringes in there, a couple of needles, a bit of uh, a cotton ball, cotton swab, and we put a pack of it. So if somebody comes in and you're asks pampering, for, you're pampering you have, them, you're pampering yeah. them, pampering them. Yeah, I mean, we have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they are the important asset of the community, you know. <laughs> so basically, we have to pay for them. So, so basically, when they comes in, I mean, a pharmacist who is working for years and years, as soon as they see, saw the faces, they know what they're after. <laughs> so basically, I said, okay, that's all right. Um, so I'll just give them the fat pack, and we we do charge for it. We do charge. We don't. Oh, do okay. Free. So do, how do yeah, they pay? Do they pay money, or do you get it from well, the government? No, they 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 pay for it. I mean, normally, one fat pack co costs them five dollars. Um, so um, then but they, actually, we ask them to. Actually, do you're putting them off because you're actually putting them off. You know, if they don't have money, right? 
and they're struggling to pay yeah. for the heroin, they wouldn't oh, take yeah. it. They would, they would prefer heroin over this flat pack. The UK we provide yeah, them for yeah. free. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Now that's 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 one of the things that we we have been. Uh, but this is what it is here. We we just try to um, do it like that. Uh, it, in, the other thing is that when if if we have if we do it for free, they will send keep sending their friends here and like they have a four or five or ten people coming asking for it. Um, so we just try to make it safe. We try to make it easy. Come pick it up and go. Um, and they always can bring those those full ones and and it's just not about it's not just these needle things it's for for the for the uh for the drug addicts it's for the insulin patients those who are who are using the ozempic or other 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 uh, for example the um, um those uh those what we say the uh, monoclonal antibodies and those sort of drugs they can also use this stuff and they can bring it over in the pharmacy and we dispose them off or maybe they send to the, the local council and they look after it uh, the other thing, which was the opioid substitution program, to be honest, I lost my faith on this program long time ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> I never see, eh, I never see anybody. Yeah, coming yeah. up. Yeah, I've seen patients coming ten to twelve years and same dose. The only thing I think um, is, is beneficial from the program is that obviously, obviously they don't buy anything from the streets, which is not really pure and probably the one we provide obviously it's licensed products it's more pure clean and um it's, it's all and the impurities found nowadays because you will sometimes you get this news that you know um a lot of drug impurities kill a lot of addicts so at least i will say at least we're keeping it safe hmm. to some extent yeah that's, that's right, think, that's right. To be, to be honest with you, it's a one-way road and yeah. i think we need to provide them support because i have seen patients who have killed themselves so you know, no, I, I remember right. I used to do this locum shift regularly, and this patient never turned up. And because they all know each other, they all sit together. They all use drug use, you know, they use together. So they're kind of like a family because they've been isolated from they know each the other, social yeah. circle. They know each other very well, and they don't actually kind of mingle in society because people kind of like push them away. So they kind of get more involved in the heroin and addiction because you know they've been pushed away as well. So I remember I used to have chat with this uh, lady. He used to, she used to come here and she was on a reduction plan, but obviously one day she didn't turn up and colleagues said she killed, she hanged herself, you know. So, I mean, it's very sad to see, obviously, you see uh, those regular patients one day they don't turn up and just say, you know, they, they've committed suicide. So, you know, they, they need support from ourselves. And obviously for most, if it doesn't work for some, I think it would work the service, you know. So, you know, as long as we're there providing this sort of, you know, moral support, support in terms of providing needles, anything really a nice piece of advice or word you would go through them i think i'll be help being a healthcare professional isn't it sorry you carry on so with the um with this sort of a the opi switch program i was i was attending a seminar last year and the the, the professor is a pretty pretty known name for for opi and he's pretty he's always be supportive about this program and he said it's not just about don't uh, he he said don't think about if somebody will be come out from from uh, this program no no either they go uh, go cold turkey or they the idea was it is to keep them safe that's what ifti bhai said just before just keep them controlled keep oh. them having the dose minimum dose to keep them going that's what the idea of the opi replacement program oh. and um, and it's all about it it's basically you try to cut down the dose but well, in the last 10 years of practice, I've never seen anybody who, who's come out from programs completely. No, never, never. Same. They like to do it. And they're just, I've, you know. seen, I've seen one or two, to be honest with you. Um, they went, they started working, they're living a good life. So, yeah. But the outcome is very, very small as compared to the support. So, it's, yeah, one of them things. All right, guys. I think we've gone through all the questions and the time running out. So, we've got a few questions to go through. And let's move on to the Q&A session. Thank you very much for answering. And thank you very much for going through all these questions. Obviously, we couldn't cover, we couldn't have covered everything in this small session, which was supposed to be under an hour. So uh, let's take our first question. So, uh, so guys, watching us, obviously, feel free to send us questions, and we'll be able to answer you. You've got the uh, pharmacists from Australia and Bradford and myself as well, we'll be able to answer any question relating to this particular topic. But then, obviously, alongside, if you have any other question other than this topic, you know, we would also be able to help you start a problem. This is what we're here for. Right. Okay. The first question is, I'll take this here on the screen. Do you have enough time for in Australia to intervene? So if you've already asked that, you know, it's difficult. <laughs> in a busy environment. I like so that. how do you see I, this? I, uh, I, I, 
I always, I always have a time to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking for intervention. You remember that ten minute hundred dollar? Look, look. If you have something in your mind that you're gonna make fifty or hundred dollars in ten minute talk, you will make a time. <laughs> nah, it's just joking. You're more I'm of joking. a businessman than a pharmacist. <laughs> nah, no, no. I, I, I'm just joking. The, yeah. the it's it's all about what sort of a community pharmacy setting you're working. If you're working in a big, big pharmacy chain where it's all about dispensing and putting a label on the box that's a different ball game but when it comes to the community pharmacy which is which is have only have 7000 population of people living in a community then you look after everyone so for example if you have two pharmacists working at the same time one would be up the front talking to the patient asking all these silly or stupid questions we can say that and one would be doing the job over there so in a dispensary so it's 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 all about it's all about managing a work and and look you don't do intervention the whole day you just take out some hours two or three hours in the morning two or three hours in the evening and just just play it smartly that's all yeah really well, i would personally do um that if it's really really busy and a lot of people waiting to be uh, seen then i will make a note and then when it's get required then i'll go speak to the gp well um it's and uh, mr anwar said that sometimes it's really hard to make time but um, just, so just make a note that you need, I, I need to go back and look at this prescription. I need to go back and look at this uh, intervention. And then when it's required, then go and speak to the GP or ring the patient and go through it. So. I personally think it's also about dedication because it's about bothering. Am yeah. I bothered? Am I bothered? I'm going to do that. You know, I'm just going to do my job and go home, you know, but yeah. it's about going an extra mile. Extra mile. You know, that's, that's going yeah, an that's, extra yeah. mile and do the intervention. Bring your patient, your customer back to you. If you don't do that, then and if they yeah. buy, that's that's the best business model. Yeah, yeah. Going out of your well, way. I'm not a business owner as yet, and I don't know. Let me share. <laughs> Let me share. No, 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 very I'm, I'm Sorry, go ahead. Uh, what, what I learned from here is that if you go and do out of, I mean, small things, not a big, small things. If you make You're a right difference, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they will come back to you. Say, yeah, sometimes when you, sometimes you know when you mentioned about. Our driver yeah. finished a bit early and the patient said, oh, I need these antibiotics. And we said, okay, you're only local. I'll drop up to you. And like yeah. that's appreciation and this, this, yeah. little things can make a huge difference in the future. So. Let me just add this example uh, myself oh, personally, right? It was, uh, I was doing a Sunday shift in a, a pharmacy, supermarket pharmacy, I wouldn't name it. And uh, it was literally closing time, 20 minutes before the closing time. And because of the habit of going, yo, know, extra mile and this, and sometimes you feel like, you know, you know what, you'll be struggling and stranding, you probably have to stay longer. What happened was this, a gentleman came with the clitromycin prescription for his wife, and it was uh, given from out of hours, uh, you know, the out of hours service. So, and then clitromycin, you know, out of habit, is she on any medication? And he goes, yeah, my wife does take uh, medications. I don't know what they are. I'm like, you know, find out. So I'm then thinking, okay, I'm gonna ring her. She's not answering. Her. I'm like, oh, what do I do now? You know, but obviously, clitromycin is a cytochrome B450 inhibitor, causes interaction with a lot of medication. And, and I and I, exactly. And I'm like, okay, let me just ask because I wasn't thinking starting because I think she was in um, um, late early, 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so earlier. So thinking about that, you know, she's not that old, and I, I highly doubt she just started. So thinking about is she in any antidepressant? And then uh, he goes, oh yeah, she does take. I'm like, which one is it? He said, I don't know. So, and then after five, 10 minutes, the wife rang back. I said, are you, what medication are you? She said, citalopram. I'm like, bingo, that's a win-win for me. Why? QT interval uh, prolongation that cause, uh, citalopram and clarithromycin, you can't give two or more drugs, you know? So I'm like, okay. And he goes like, okay, I'm really sorry. I can't give you that drug back. Also, so, I'm like, it causes this, you know, basically changes in your ECG and heart. And goes, okay, and she's over 40 anyway. So I may have to contact the doctor. Although it's a very short term, it's only a seven years course duration. But obviously, as a pharmacist, my job is to make sure I bring this intent to prescribe is prescribed it. If he wants to take responsibility, that's fine. I can notify, yeah, I can amend the notes and say, look, I've double checked with the prescriber. I rang the out of hours number, spoke to the GP. Thank you very much. I did not know she was on regular medication, especially Stalopram. I'll change it now. Straight away, change the doxycycline. And I have to wait five extra minutes to be able to do that, obviously. But then the patient has been, oh my God, you like you guys know lots, man. How did you know that? Do you know what I mean? So that sort of thing, obviously, is a, it's a confidence booster. You feel good about it. You know, you've done something good today, you know? I mean, little, small little things help, you know, so on top of that. If you don't know the things, for example, QTC, because I work in heart hospitals, so I know these things. But if we don't, then you know, it doesn't take long to open a BNF or any other book which has all these things, you know, just quickly go through it, and then you would know. And then 
once you come across these situations more often, you remember them on top of your head. So I mean, pharmacists usually ask, uh, how do you go, going to change and how do you improve your knowledge? It's all about coming into practice. And this is why I always say, pharmacy is not a theoretical profession. It's a practice-based profession. If you don't practice, you would not remember or not know anything. You have to practice to be able to remember that. Right, sorry. Uh, next question. So uh, I'll ask Ifti to answer that first. And then uh, nowadays, we know, this asked from Sundar Said, as we know the COVID-19 common, those who are using Canadex, what's Canadex? Steroid. Steroid. Is it safe for you, young, uh, youth age around 20, 21 to 26? Right, for Ifti. So, well, there's a lot of things going around COVID-19 nowadays. So um, use of steroids, um, any medical evidence? No. Um, is the patient who's um, been tested positive with COVID, the main question is, if they got any un un underlying medical conditions, if they got any respiratory disease, are they, got, are they immune compromised? So immune compromised kind of, if they're going under cancer treatment, uh, chemotherapy, they're taking anything to suppress their um, immune system, then um, I think in most of the countries, it's all symptomatic treatment, so uh, respiratory complication, with COVID, you treat respiratory disease. Any other complications, uh, you just treat. Um, taking steroid just to reduce the side effects or the complication of COVID-19, I don't think there's any medical evidence yeah. that it helps. Um, might do if the patient has got his, his respiratory conditions. Um, Sometimes when it first came out, we saw a lot of uh, dexamethasone use, which is kind That's of really steroids, uh, canadox. Um, um, there's another medicine being mentioned recently. Avi um has been tried. Avi yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I don't. I'm trying, think but no. It's been recognized no. by the guidelines as yet. No. Um, no. So our Not yet. The, patient, the person who has been tested positive, the patient has been tested positive with COVID nineteen, no other complications, just steam inhalation, etc. Keep um, stay away so you don't spread it. Um, and just uh, vitamin C and zinc can help. Towards immune boost system, system, yeah. booster, so that that could help. Um, but I, I, I own, I, and none of the professional pharmacists, professional pharmacists, or GP will recommend steroid use straight away because you've been tested positive with COVID, uh, because the complication, the side effects, are a lot more greater than the benefits. And also, so, depending on patients, that you have to take this approach of benefit yeah, out exactly. the risk. You know, is it good yeah. for you? Is it not good for you? So that's the exactly. yes. done by the every, clinician. Like not we always say that side. every single patient is very different from each other. So it just, I mean, just. If you want to use it, just please get um, an expert opinion from uh, a doctor, um, a, a physician. Uh, see what see what they say about doing use it. You know, because you search in the Google and they said all these things are good for COVID nineteen. Right, Anwar, yourself. Well, I'm just second to if it's more about preventative measures, nothing else. I mean, like, there's a lot of myths and a lot of things that we can do about it, but it's just nothing basically. Right. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all about how you... Right. One line answer years. for these questions. Sorry. One line answer just to wrap it up. Wrap this session up. Okay. So students in Pakistan are more focused into getting the marks done, CGPA and all those things, you know. They've got a question here. For, for a broader study, how many CP, how CP, CGPA is required? So Australia and then England. Anwar? Well, I don't think so. You need a CGPA for, for the Australia. You just have to have a degree. Yeah, and, and a mark sheet. That's it. That's uh, it. That's what you need. I don't think so. That's right. the needed. If they, well, um, so uh, I think your academic qualification and you said practice qualification, uh, practice experience, which is more important. I'll go for practice experience. So more really practice, practice, more scenarios, more uh, kind of expose yourself to more challenges yeah. and learn more from your challenges. Academic qualification, we all done degrees. Um, how, how much did we know when you came out to the practical field? Yeah. Zero. We I all learned from experience. We had the basic knowledge. Don't get me wrong. Um, th thank you very much to our brilliant teachers. Um, I'm from Peshawar University. There was legends there. We learned a lot, uh, but we started learning from practicing. So as Abdurrahman said, you come across a scenario, you learn from it. You come across to that, you, you you see that prescription again, and you say, "Oh, I dealt with that." It, like before, you look into it, and so so um, obviously academic qualification is very important. But if you don't Apply that in practice. Um, I don't think it will benefit patients. Right. You know why I, I I call this as something to ask me about care qualification and theory, theory and practice based. It's the same as obviously when we came to the UK, we had to do the driving test, a theory driving test, and a practice driving test. 
A lot of people have passed the theory driving test. Okay, brilliant. I knew everything about it. Right, let's drive. Let's sit down on the steering wheel. Okay, the steering wheel gear. And then they think obviously in the head, oh my God, I'm just going to go. I am uh, Michael Chumaka. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then they start driving the car, they realize it's a completely different ball game. You know, it's good to have, it's actually vital to have this information, but at the same time, pharmacy is the same. And, uh, and so does medicine as well. You know, you have the knowledge and a lot of uh, medicine graduates that we see, if they've not initially practiced it, they've actually left the profession, joined the pharmaceutical company or doing something else because, you know, actually they've not been associating themselves with practice. Is that all right, yeah? Yeah. That's right, okay, so next question on multivitamins. So Anwar, multivitamins use over the counter. Hmm. A business point of view or a clinical point of view? <laughs> <laughs> Both. <The> clinical session. <laughs> uh, oh, multivitamins. Yeah, that's 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 the um. Oh, sometimes you go for the multivitamins. Say, oh, you you need something. But but when I approach to a patient, I say, okay. What do you need? Oh, I'm not feeling. No, I'm having a good sleep. I have been uh, being let down all the day, all the time, and I've been tired, lethargic. Okay, that's fine. Well, give me more. Okay, would you want to have multivitamin? But sometimes multivitamins cause upset tummy or a diarrhea because it's too strong for them. So you just have to figure it out what 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 actually the need is. Like for example, if somebody is 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 is, is low in vitamin B12. Why do you need vitamin A and B and C? You just give them vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. Or or just just some somebody needs the he just needs the um the nicotinamide so just give them nicotinamide so vitamin B twelve is good I mean the multivitamin is good is all right you can give them multi multivitamin but what's actually the need is why did you want the increase the uh, the the pills count if you don't need it don't use it simple mm -hmm. as that fifty you can you can have you can have a healthy diet and have everything mm -hmm. don't don't eat too much KFC and McDonald's just eat the uh, healthy diet and you'll be all right that's what it is yeah. <laughs> That's it, AFT. Well, uh, yeah, so Sam, um, how balanced your diet is? Do you eat a good amount of fish, do fruit, vegetables, mm -hmm. uh, which contains... Um, uh, my personal kind of thing is one of my child, he doesn't like fruit. He doesn't eat fruit at all. So I give him multivitamins because he, he, he he's not his, uh, diet is not balanced. So um, if you're worried that your child is deficient in vitamins, um, get blood tests done. Yeah, Look and also it's about, about yeah. what sort of fruits he doesn't like. So if he doesn't like to eat citrus fruits, you yes, kind like of speak to the vitamin C. So yeah, it's exactly. about taking the rationale. But if you don't know if, it, speak to the pharmacist about if it. If you don't eat enough fish, you are lacking in vitamin A. Yeah. So um, kind of different things. Um, so get the blood test done, uh, done, see which vitamin your child is deficient in. And then um, and obviously in the UK, uh, Australia get a uh, good sunlight but you know sunlight in uk because it's all cloudy all over the so a lot all of children vitamin, D. vitamin d3 so because vitamin yeah. d3 is not produced um especially in our darker skin um mm -hmm. so you will see a lot of prescriptions given through vitamin d3 since good a few years now of the one you've probably seen them like very high dose exactly so exactly in just different scenario in pakistan obviously the sun light is quite strong and it goes to the skin mm -hmm. so i think vitamin d3 wouldn't be an issue there but just get the blood test done um if the, your diet is not balanced as abdul rahman said if you're lacking um certain things you know which would the child is lacking and then take it but it's a side effect mr anwar said that you know to me ache and stuff like that that can be the side effects we'll yes, do another sir. session of vitamin d because i think it's covering a lot of people I, will, I will i will take i will just reply one uh, just one respond one thing vitamin d now all these subcontinent people which I come across to have a low vitamin D here. I don't know why the reason is, but they are, especially the kids, young ones. Even even I've seen people who have a bone deformity. Yeah. yeah, bone deformity because they are like they start walking and they have they have the issues. So I would say vitamin D on vitamin D now it just says vitamin D is 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 related to the immune response. Vitamin D deficiency can cause more more cancers. So. It's it's very important for the subcontinent people for for Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh who like to have more vitamin D in the body. And to be honest, because of the 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 uh, socioeconomic issues, um, we don't check, we don't take these things seriously. To be honest, yeah, uh, yeah we think true. that uh, we, we we think that the uh, the sun will look after it, us, but it's not basically. I think There's it's about taking the sun as well. It's about taking yeah. the sun as well. We are living in an atmosphere environment where we have air conditioned around. 
We used to play cricket outside. You see all these kids playing video games and actually going out physically engaging themselves in sports and other activities. So these are the impacts, obviously. And it's not just Pakistan or another, you know, it's globally. It's a global impact. But, 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 when you mentioned. The best but, thing is, but, 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 said, but, get it tested, get the levels and get it treated. And know how yeah, to treat yeah, it that's right. The treatment have guidelines. So I think I'm planning to do a session on vitamin D to be able to see what the loading dose, how the loading dose works, what's the uh, maintenance dose like, over how many weeks you can give or best practice to give. Because in Pakistan, I've seen 200,000 units, you know, and which obviously we don't follow here. We give it over six to seven weeks. But obviously, we use different approaches, well, but we never give 200,000 in one go or more than that because some of the patients that I've seen, they've taken, you know, hundreds of thousands of units, you know, because vitamin D toxicity obviously causes, uh, you know, the uh, high calcification, uh, what do you call it, uh, increase your absorption of calcium obviously there are other risk factors involved so it's not a it's not a very light thing i mean you know it's very rare to have vitamin d toxicity but again at the same time obviously it helps the absorption of calcium so you know these things obviously are counter best thing is to get it tested <clears throat> and uh, uh, speak to the clinician who knows about guidelines not just uh, people who fuck, fuck some practice is really poor like just giving everybody without testing them a very high dose of vitamin d and what just one more thing to add. Yeah, we have this thing that we we think that uh, uh, all the day sun helps you to make vitamin D. It's not correct. It's early day yeah. and evening time. There are certain rays that helps to make the vitamin D in your under your skin. So in Pakistan, we all we all got up at eleven a.m. in the morning. They start we start working. So it's it's basically that's why it's been so 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 essential and so important. To have the vitamin D, and that's why we're having too many, too many cancers uh, patients over there because there are new research saying that lack of vitamin D is causing more importantly co colon cancer and breast cancers. So mm. that's that's basically one of the things that they've been they've been right. saying now. Okay, um, so we've been answering yeah. questions very in detail. I've got a few questions to cover. We just answer one or two lines, you know, and finish this off. So another question from Ahmed Bashir is about pharmacy prescribing is also evolving in many countries. But I think uh, my answer to that would be uh, pharmacists should be focused more on their practices than thinking about prescribing because prescribe, they, if they become a prescriber, they'd be better prescriber if they know the practice. So moving on straight to prescribing because we're not actually a medicine graduate is different. And also we've been doing lots of mistakes, not knowing what the drugs and what can cause it. That's my input. Anwar, yours and then Ifti's. About what about pharmacy prescribing? Nah, nah. Uh, we are way behind. We are, we are yeah. way behind for pharmacy yeah. prescribing. Uh, I yeah. think we still have to ten years to go to get to that level. Yeah. Um, pretty much, we 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 Aussies are pretty laid back to be honest. So we yeah. are just uh, sitting. In, but but like I said, I'm when I'm in a community pharmacy, I'm yeah. prescribing. Yeah. That's it for I minor guess. ailments. I'm giving yeah. I'm giving medicine. I'm happy exactly. with that. I yeah. don't need to be. I don't need to be to prescribe. So it's it's all about how you see things. Um, yeah. But yeah, as a, as a prescribing ph a pharmacist, uh, we have a long way to go. Yeah, me and Ifti, we studied together prescribing. And Ifti, your input, please, on this mm -hmm. question. Well, um, I think there are um, pros and cons. So, um, pharmacists prescribing because Abdul Rahman said we don't have as much clinical and kind of diagnostic knowledge as the GPs and the doctors, so it can be sometimes a bit dangerous, but. Sometimes, uh, if you work in community pharmacy and you're a prescriber, it gives you the plus point that um, I, I don't know if both of you will agree with me that sometimes the prescriber, the way they prescribe is right, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it doesn't suit the community pharmacy. Uh, you know, the park size is sometimes because what they do, like I'll give you an example that uh, we had a one year old child uh, with respiratory condition um, last week. I don't know what to screw or was given part but they were given prednisolone one uh, five milligram tablets two tablets daily but they're given tablets so this solution available which is probably more kind of you know good product for a one-year-old child to drink it and then take a tablet but co what comes to that the cost because the, the the solution is about more 25 to 30 pound more expensive mm -hmm. than the tablets uh, so if, if it was a community pharmacist prescribing that prescription i'm sure he would have gone for the solution not for the tablet just yeah. so the, the GP who prescribed it, they didn't have the knowledge that there's a solution available as well you can give to a younger child and not the tablet. How the, the child is going to solve our tablet is kind of challenge for the parents. So um, there's like, you know, it's, we can do a 
I feel such an under to be honest with you. It's, it's, it's too many times. I think <laughs> I think it's about a clinical and also the legal aspect. Exactly, so yeah. You're actually changing prescription yeah. legally. Well, um, actually, your involvement is you're sticking to the same drug, but you're changing the formulation, changing the availability of what yeah. actually works out yeah. best for that patient. Yeah. So, so uh, Abdul Rahman and me went together. We did uh, kind of prescribing together, um, and um, so they asked you to choose a specific kind of you know what you want to specialize in so we both got i think we got went for hypertension so mm -hmm. that give the gp a bit like it kind of helping the gps out to be honest with you so exactly um you know a continuous prescribing repeat authorization mm -hmm. um yeah. so you can do that in your own specialized kind of field mm -hmm. um so um i think it will benefit we'll see it's, it's, it's quite new in the I, I, in the UK, the uh, independent prescribers since a good few years now, but it's increasing a lot and a lot going into GP surgeries. But um, I think in a few years' time, we will know that was a good step or uh, mm. didn't help at all. So. Right. I think we, from now on, we'll take one question and one of us would answer it. Just finish. Do this patient listen to intervention? Like, what's your feedback? Post it and why? Want to answer that, please? What is that? Do you want to answer this question on the screen, please? Do patient listen to your intervention? Like, what your feedback process? Well, some do, some don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 all about uh, how you how you approach them and. Uh, but look, some 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 of them have uh, more important things to do, so we just say, okay, that's fine. You, 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 we're gonna come back or not, but that's fine. Um, but some of them who really value a pharmacist's input, listen to it and understand what's what what we have to have to say. And 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 like I said, I mean, it's about. How frequent they are coming? How 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 much you um, give them importance about their medication? That's what it is. Uh, if you if you talk to them casually, say, oh, you you, you know, this is the tablet, and you know, understand. But they want to say, okay, that's fine. He's just doing his job. But if you really show your concern about the thing, yeah, no, why not? Yeah, they listen to you. Thank you, Aves, and thank you, Anwar. Thank you, Aves, for your uh, lovely comment. Attending the session for the first time, and he's really surprised to see. Farms supporting, guiding other pharmacists and confidence boosting. Uh, you're welcome. And if they would like you to answer this one, please, on the screen. Well, my first question will be, uh, will be um, neuropathic pain. So is it diabetic as well? Or, 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 um, obviously, we need more information in that question. Yeah. Um, if yeah. they're getting a uh, burning sensation in his palms and feet, kindly answer this. Um, so obviously, come to um, um, we will would like to know his age, his other comorbidities, um, his blood circulation okay? Kind of you know um, um, we need to examine is any swelling down ankle area and the feet. Um, so um, obviously, this Abdurrahman created these pages and uh, it's been good probably a few years and uh, he's helping a lot of pharmacists you know getting registered how to work in community pharmacy throughout other countries. So. Um, Hira Ahmed. So, if you send the question and a bit more information, please to mm. family, uh, which yeah. Abdurrahman will receive, then we should yeah. be able to answer it. But we need more info. Yeah. So, so um, we need his age. We need um, what other medication. Other he takes, things. Other well. Coma, comorbidities as well. Yeah. Try to help you. Thank you very much. For right. Thank you. Aves, you've uh, come back saying dexamethasone is obviously part of standard treatment. So, uh, in the UK, it's not the standard treatment; it's the trial. So, a patient comes on here in hospital, we will put them in trial, and it's a concentrated trial. Patient doesn't want to do it. They can't. You know, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do it. So it's not like we can't just push everything. It's not a national guideline. So it's like uh, for the time being, if the symptoms are documented, obviously, uh, you know. And then again, we have the scoring system. So the patient qualifies for that trial, then they get it. If they don't qualify, they don't get it. Again, you have to look at the bigger picture to see if uh, these tick boxes would help. So thank you for that question. What type of course is available for being pharmacists, individual prescribers? If they, that's for you, please. Uh, so the course is uh, available, obviously, uh, in the UK. Um, is to prepare you as a prescriber. So the uh, obviously the first the first um, kind of part is the law and ethics. So what can you prescribe? You what you can't prescribe. Uh, then it, as I mentioned, that then you specialize in one certain area. So our hypertension. So mm. you go through more guidelines, uh, more. And then you can develop yourself once you develop yourself in the area in exactly. Practice. You want to go to so yeah. the course is quite short to be honest with you. It's uh, mm. probably a year. Uh, and then um, obviously you, uh, as a pharmacist, you already got the clinical knowledge, uh, you need all the classification and the um, interaction, etc. Sometimes when you go into a surgery, you will um, identify more interaction than the GPs because mm. they don't have that knowledge. They're really good mm. at diagnosis, but interaction and um, as we mentioned, deep prescribing, I think pharmacists are a lot better than GPs. 
So um, the, different universities deploy different courses. Uh, their criteria is a bit different, but at the end, you, you have the same knowledge and uh, the same experience. But uh, mm -hmm. it comes with practice. So when you become a prescriber, you go to a GP surgery. If you are in doubt, obviously you got a GP to ask uh, you, before you make a decision. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you're a UK pharmacist, then you can look into it. And um, uh, even in Pakistan, I think, um, uh, obviously, you, uh, pharmacists do prescribe, as um, Mr. Anwar said, for minor ailments. So when somebody comes to you and you sell something for minor ailment, that is kind of prescribing because you mm -hmm. make that decision what to sell and what right. to prescribe. For. Brilliant. So next question is uh, important to actually make patient comply with your suggestion. How can we manage it? Manage the follow up means in a week or two to see, you know, if they are uh, experiencing the same sort of symptoms, is the medication related? If it is, obviously, you can refer it back to the GP working community pharmacy, and this is how you can manage. Okay, so the next session, uh, question, I think will be probably the last one. And why for you, is Kendall safe for sugar patient? And as I've listened, it's back from heart. Not sure about that. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, that's not so I my... I think there's a mixed opinion. Yeah. I mean, I'm not in my knowledge as well. So we'll have yeah, to yeah, no, I don't okay. think so. Yeah, right. So we have to look nice into it. I'm yeah. not sure about that. So uh, let's see if you have any questions. So what's this? Uh, my relative in Pakistan and one of the doctor from here, UK, asked me to tell the doctor in jab drugs. No, that's fine. So six milligram daily basis, not until daily basis, fixed. I think ten days course. Uh, so you know, it's uh, not for long term. So in the UK, it was given for ten days course. And I mean, he suggested. Obviously, he's gone through questions. The UK doctor. And if you thought that it'd be appropriate for that patient, obviously it's a, it's, a bad, it's, it's, it's a good suggestion. Again, he would have done the assessment. So you can't generalize those trial uh, treatment uh, for COVID. Okay, so uh, thank you. Guide importance and scope of BPS certificates. Okay, we can do that for a huge, huge uh, topic, obviously BPS certification courses. It's an American program and it's different. Okay, let's move on to see what we have some of the relatives hypothyroidism some have hypothyroidism but both are taking thyroxin is it okay hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism have different treatments you know so you say carbimazole for hyper hyperthyroidism hypothyroidism you take levothyroxine so why would you take levothyroxine for hyperthyroidism anyway so uh i don't know why they both are taking thyroxine for, um and you want to add if oh. was saying something Okay, yeah. So obviously for hyperthyroidism, you give thyroxine um, just to get the level and the balance right. For hyperthyroidism, you give thyroxine as well because you give the medicines to lower the thyroid. Uh, yeah. It's something, a status called euthyroid. Yeah. Uh, so you need to achieve that. So um, when the thyroxine level is going really low, you give thyroxine with carbimazole or sometimes with uh, to to maintain that level. Brilliant. So we've got this. I'm um, hypo. I never felt okay even after taking thyroxine. I feel better when I take vitamin C, a probiotic, zinc, on regular basis. Which works for you better? Obviously, is a patient-centered approach and customized care. So, uh, so this patient says, "I'm talking about independent but collaborative prescribing." Okay. So we'll continue that with that later on. So right. So here I must come back saying sugar level is normal. We can, you know, we can carry on with these questions. How do we know in lab report someone is having insulin resistance? Right. This last question before we go. And why do you want to answer that, please? Is that how do we know in lab report that someone is having insulin resistance? Hmm. We. How do we address that? I mean, insulin resistance. How do we know in the reports that we saw the basically the the for the diabetes we just check two of the um, either we go for the uh, blood sugar levels or what we go for the uh, hba1c um so in order to find insulin resistance well this how do we do that i mean can, I, can I, we I actually do that ladies sometimes so they give a really a bolus dose of uh, sugar um just and, and that like, they can they, they can know that the uh, ogtt yeah um, insulin yeah, uh, yeah, resistance. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really good question because um, uh, I was doing some, it wasn't a research kind of project, but I was doing some stuff with diabetes and we do we do know how much sugar is in blood, uh, patient's blood, but we never, uh, there's no technology or anything which can measure insulin in the body. So sometimes there's enough insulin in the body, but the resistance is so high that the blood sugar is high. So I think it's a really good question, and um, I, I won't be surprised to see some of um, devices coming out. Like you will see blood sugar testing strips and blood sugar testing machines, and there will be insulin testing 
machines which will check the insulin level mm. in the body mm. so um and, and mm. that way um how they can increase the insulin injection dose you know the one you take from external so that's a really good question they're looking into it already somewhere and yeah uh, they will right. imagine yeah, insulin, really uh, uh, we'll do the fashion or endocrinology will cover those insulin questions yeah. and obviously we'll be more focused on clinical aspects of today's program so guys thank you very much for joining us thank you for watching our program please share the session because uh, our guests have obviously given their time, commitment to be able to share their knowledge and expertise and practice experience with yourself on this particular topic. Before we go and take some last note from Anwar and FT, for next Sunday's show, we have a clinical trial pharmacist from London. He'll be sharing his experience and what he does on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, for other pharmacists and fellow colleagues and also the future pharmacists uh, to be able to tell them about the role. So if they're interested to go in clinical trials, then they, they would have one-to-one uh, -one and a live uh, conversation in Q&A session with the clinical trials pharmacist. And the following week after that would be 15th of August, I believe, uh, we would do a session on EPMA, uh, the role of uh, electronic prescribing and medication administration, uh, pharmacist, uh, their involvement in that software and how do they manage the electronic prescribing. So thank you very much, my guest, Anwar Ahmed and uh, uh, Iftikhar Ali really for joining and giving you, providing your time to our students and also families who follow family page. And once again, Anwar, last note before we finish and Iftikhar yourself as well. So Anwar, over to you before we finish and goodbye from myself. Anwar, over to you, please. Thanks, Abdurrahman. Um, in the end, I would say just one thing. Um, it doesn't matter what university you're from. It doesn't matter how much you study, how, how brilliant you are, how much how much marks you have on your, your, your mark sheet or a degree. It's all about, in the end, how understanding you are. Look, any Tom, Dick and Harry can can go through the um, the um, uh, can can go through the knowledge and have a lot of lot of knowledge in there. It's just about how you process it and how you deliver it and how you can make a difference in somebody's life that's what it's matter so humbleness is very important comprehension is very important if you're coming overseas to any 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 country any country i would say it's just more about that you need to understand their perspective their their what they what they're trying to say what they have you just come up and just you just throw up all the knowledge you have they don't really care about that they just know you know, what what matters to them so i hope that what that will make a difference i think this this session will help you help a little bit and be happy to help in the future if, if the near so so thank you thank so you much. very much and for your time i really appreciate that session is going to one and a half hours it planned for an hour if the guy your last and uh, leaving comments please and the finish yeah, so note exactly same as mr anwar um the main thing is how you apply your knowledge if you don't apply it and you have the knowledge uh, it, it, it doesn't benefit the patient. It doesn't benefit the organization. Um, it's, it's no use. So um, learn, uh, even in Pakistan, any countries you are practicing, please apply your knowledge. Please provide patient-centered patient care. Um, make patient your cent um, the attention center of attention. Um, if you are making a decision, please involve the patient. Um, and please try to um, make decisions which are beneficial for the patient and not for the business. So. Uh, that way the patient will come back to you the customer will come back to you they will they will have the faith um, and you will get more in the future so um uh, anywhere you're practicing good luck and if you need anything um obviously we are still through we will learn a lot but we're still learning more me and yeah. Anwar. so uh if is any, it, is if anything we can help with just uh, send a question to the family group and um uh, one of us will answer it for you thank you very much for your thank you very for much thank you guys thank you. for watching Bye. and thank you once again thank you for much environment and also family thank, thank you. you very much and i'll see you next sunday thanks very thank much, much. Thank bye you. take care